engage in some microaggressions this morning, so I thought I'd get you smiling before we, we got too far. <clears throat> As an angry old white man, I excel in microaggressions, <clears throat> and, uh, but I do find it humorous that, uh, that, especially in our universities today, that you can't engage in dialogue to challenge people, to make them think because you're causing them to be uncomfortable with thinking. <clears throat> How many of you took debate class in high school? It's something they don't really offer much anymore, but debate, I would, my mother made me take it three years in a row. And you know, you learn about how to listen and, and discuss in a civil manner when you, you go through these classes, but it seems like we don't like to do that much anymore. So that was in honor of Tim Allen after his show got canceled this week <clears throat> because he was too conservative for ABC, I guess. I don't know. His, his ratings were pretty good. but Anyway, this morning, since I opened a can of words, worms two weeks ago, I figured I'd leave that can open and I'd just dump it on the table. And we are going to talk a little bit more about sanctuary concepts this morning, hence the microaggressions. <clears throat> Our text this morning, 1 John 1, verse 9 to 10, says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful. Wait a minute. Read that very carefully. There's this little two-letter word up there that really irritates us in Scripture. If. It's amazing how many times people miss that little word, if. If implies what? Conditionality, right? If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we're going to talk about confession of sins in light of what is taught through the sanctuary. And I will do the best that I can to, to help you understand what I understand. And if you see it differently, that's okay, because that's what dialogue and discussion and wrestling is all about. For me, when I was presented the sanctuary, I came to understand it as a model similar to what children play with. Your little girls, some of your little girls, had model dollhouses. And it was a replica of a real house. Now, what's the flaw in a replica? There's only so much you can gar garnish or gather from a replica because the replica is a simplified version. The real house that this was modeled after is far more complex than the model. This does not have running water or flushing toilets. This does not have electricity or TVs or any of those things that we take for granted, the behind-the-scenes things. But you can learn a lot from a model. And our children learn a lot with playing with models. Our boys play with models of cars and trucks, and girls play with dolls. And all of these things are a facsimile or a model of something bigger. So that's what the sanctuary has come to, from my understanding of the sanctuary has been, it's a model. It's a biblical model in which God is trying to teach us some things about the plan of salvation. Now I'm not going to get into the specifics of some of the more um, <clears throat> less than favorable views on specifics of Adventism. I want to look at this from a biblical perspective. The foremost authority, biblical authority, on the book of Leviticus is named Jacob Milgram. He's a conservative Jew who has written a commentary on just the book of Leviticus, which is in excess of 2,700 pages on one book. This book that you see here that can be purchased at Amazon is only 300 pages. So this is Leviticus for idiots. If you want the real thing, you get the three-volume set that's almost 2,700 pages. But if you want to know, from a Jewish perspective, the understanding of the, of the sanctuary and how it was understood as a ritual, you go read Jacob Milgram. And that's where uh, one of the leading Adventist scholars in sanctuary understanding, Roy Gain, he was a student of Jacob Milgram, and he gained a lot of insight and understanding from Jacob about this. I have tried to read Jacob Milgram, and it is heavy stuff. It's not easy. But I'm going to try to give you some clues of some of the things that I, I gleaned from reading him. 
Leviticus 5, verse 5 and 6 says, So it shall be when he, come, <clears throat> when he becomes guilty in one of these that he shall confess. See, confession was a huge component in the sanctuary. Every time somebody came to the sanctuary with an offering, they laid their hands on the head of the offering and they confessed their sins. And if you remember what I did two weeks ago when I talked about Jesus as the model, uh, and we find Jesus throughout, when you come with your sacrifice, the sacrifice represents Jesus, and you can't even come to the sanctuary without Jesus, but then you confess your sins. And I'm going to talk about the process, the, sacrimony, or the, the, um, the liturgical process of confession in the sanctuary. Now the word used in confession here, the Hebrew word, is literally to hand out the hand or to throw away or to hand off to pass it on. It's interesting that word gives several connotations to the uh, impetus and, and the symbology of sin here. Because when you confess your sins to the lamb, you are handing it off, you are passing it on, you are removing it from yourself. If you confess your sins, God is faithful to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So, in the context of the Hebrew word used here for confession, it means to throw off or to pass on to the sin offering your sin. Showing the concept of transference, and transference is a huge element. And Jacob Milgram makes a big deal out of this concept of transferring guilt from you to the animal, and then ultimately the animal to the sanctuary. So we've read this already. Psalms 103, and I've heard people quote this text. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgression from us. Hmm. When we confess our sins, our transgressions are removed and placed in a sanctuary, whether it's real or imagined, it is removed from you. You are then cleansed from guilt. Now this is a good thing, and sometimes we get hung up, and I know it has been presented in such a way that, oh, I've got to confess my sins, I hate this. No, this is a good thing. If you had hazardous waste in your back pocket, wouldn't you like it to dispose it in a place that's safe that's not going to harm you? How many of you would need to be coaxed to put hazardous waste in a waste deposit that would be lead line and protected and will be totally removed from you? Anybody need to be coaxed to do that? God said sin is toxic waste. And when you confess it, God removes it from you. He takes it away. This is a good thing. But this is one of the primary teachings of the sanctuary is the removal of sin and guilt from the penitent. But there's that word, if you confess your sins. Can God remove the sin if you don't give it to him? No, he can't. He won't because he honors choice. He invites you to come and confess your sins. He pleads with you. He tries to make it as easy as possible, but he won't force you. You have to make the decision to come to him, to lay your sins on him, and he then takes them and cleanses you from all unrighteousness. And for me, when I understood this concept, and when I, when I read what Jacob Milgram was talking about, this concept of transference, this was a good thing. This was a positive thing. This is, I don't want to lose sight of this, because this is really what frees us. So when we for confess, God removes our sins from us. But to where? Well, the sanctuary says he removes our sin, and the sanctuary then becomes the repository for sin. It becomes the hazardous waste container. But it can only be placed there if, if we confess our sins. Then, if you put hazardous waste into a container, does that container get contaminated? So if you put the hazardous waste of sin into the heavenly sanctuary, does the heavenly sanctuary get contaminated? Yes. And hence, the, the, the text in Daniel 8.14 until 2,300 evenings and mornings, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Cleansed of what? 
all of the sins that have been confessed and placed into the hazardous waste container. Now, irrespective of how you want to understand the timing and the prophecy there, the teaching of the sanctuary clearly states when we confess our sin, God removes it. He places it in a place as far as the east is from the west away from us. He eliminates it's a lead line container. It's not getting out. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our, infirmity, our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all of their sin into the depths of the sea. Here's another metaphor, and we've talked about this. God taking our sins and casting it to the depths of the sea. What do we know about the ocean today? Pretty deep, isn't it? There are parts of the ocean that we haven't even explored it's so deep. But this is a metaphor to show how much that when God removes our sin, you aren't going to be able to fish it back out. The problem comes in is do we really give our sins to God? Because if God is cleansing you from all unrighteousness, then that should be removing guilt from us. But if the guilt isn't gone away, then the first question we ask is, have you given it to God? Have you truly confessed your sins? Have you allowed him to cleanse you of all unrighteousness? And that seems to be the circular thinking that people have, is that, oh, I, I, I confess my sins, but the next day they suddenly feel guilt and remorse and, and pain and suffering. Did you give your sins to God? Because he's going to take and put it in a lead line container, and he's going to store it up, and he's going to say, I have freed you, I have redeemed you, and I have cleansed you from all unrrighteousness. So, the transference model, and this is key in, in Jacob Milgram in his book. Sin is daily, continually transferred into the sanctuary, into the sanctuary. There is actually, in the application of the blood, there is a flow in. Because the blood is placed either at the altar of burnt offering, and in some cases, the alt it is taken inside and placed in front of the altar of incense, depending on the sin and the type of sacrifice. So there's multiple ways, but Jacob was the one who, who first identified this, that there was a flow of transference always going into the sanctuary through the confession of sins. So when we confess our sins, they're transferred from us through the blood of Jesus into a repository. As far as the east is from the west and deeper than the deepest ocean, God wants to remove guilt from you. So I've talked about all this. But our sins then cause contamination because God is a perfect God. God is not a God of sin. But think about the act of God in his willingness to contaminate heaven on your behalf. Think about that. Heaven is perfect. But in God's plan, in what he has modeled in the sanctuary, he removes your sin and places it in a place that is holy. A place that has never been contaminated. But he is willing to take your sins to contaminate his house. Think about the concept of this. This is amazing. This is a willingness on God. It's like he goes over to your house and takes all the trash and throws it in his house. Think about that. Would you do that? Especially if the trash was hazardous waste. I'm not going to want to do that. I'm not going to want to contaminate my house. But God says, I'm going to contaminate my house for the benefit of my people. I'm going to remove their sins. So heaven becomes a place of contamination. It becomes a place of temporary hazardous waste storage. At least that's what I understand from the teaching of the sanctuary. And this is a positive thing. This isn't negative. But there's only one little problem if we confess our sins. Do you have a vested interest in confessing your sins? Yes, you do. Why is it so hard? Why is it so difficult? Why is it so infrequent that we really do? Why is it today in our society we want to redefine sin so we don't have to confess? 
And who is it that defines sin? God. So when God defines sin and we're uncomfortable with it, instead of confessing it, we redefine it. Guess what? That sin is not being transferred to the heavenly sanctuary. And when it's not being transferred, what does that mean for you? That you're carrying contaminants. That you're carrying guilt and a burden that God never intended or desired for you to carry. So who is it that has a vested interest in you not confessing? If you have a vested interest and a positive benefit in confessing your sins, who would rather you did not confess your sins? There is an enemy who doesn't want you to do this. And he will try to make you feel bad. He will try to make you rationalize and justify because he doesn't want you to follow God's plan. He doesn't want the model to be successful. And so today we have people who are preaching a gospel without confession. You don't need to. God accepts you the way you are. That's true, he does. But he says, come to me. Bring your burdens to me. Confess to me and I will remove all guilt from you. But it's not happening anymore today. We have redefined religion. We have redefined God's understanding of sin and the hazardousness of its waste. And we have been living in it so much that we don't even understand the deadliness of this disease that's infecting us as a society, as individuals. And every time we call sin, sin, people scream, that's a microaggression. How dare you define sin? How dare you tell me what right and wrong is? Look, I'm only telling you what God says sin is. But God wants to remove, us, remove from us all of our sins and the guilt that is accompanied with it. But we're in a really difficult position right now because we're not following the model. We don't understand the significance of the model of confession. We're redefining sin and our need for confession. And God is standing there saying, folks, I want to take this from you. I want to remove guilt, pain, and suffering from you. But you're ignoring the only place that you can place this is to place it on him in the sanctuary. <clears throat> Are you beginning to see defects in your character? This is a quote from Ellen White. Do you feel helpless and discouraged? Look to Jesus, who knows your every weakness and pities your every infirmity. He came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It is no disgrace to confess our sins and forsake them. The disgrace rests upon those who know their sins, but continue in them and grieve the dear, their dear Savior by their own crooked paths. A knowledge of our wrongs should be more highly prized than a happy flight of feeling, for it is the evidence that the Spirit of God is striving with us and that angels are round about us. Well, this introduces another interesting concept. The way that the role of the Holy Spirit has been reinterpreted in many churches today. Being preached from pulpits around the country and here in Reading, what is the role of the Holy Spirit according to popular theology? To make you feel good. You know you got the Holy Spirit when you feel good. You laugh, but that's what's being taught. But what is the true role of the Holy Spirit today? What has it always been? When Jesus said, I'm going to send you another comforter, what was the purpose in sending a comforter? To convict of sin and righteousness. Because it is through the working of the Holy Spirit that our consciences are pricked, and we now know that we need to confess, that we need to bring our sins and deposit it in the sanctuary to get rid of the hazardous waste. But if we redefine the theology of the Holy Spirit, guess what? There's no need to confess. We're just supposed to feel good. If you've got that warm, tingly feeling in your tummy, then the Holy Spirit must be there. Now, if we go to Acts, and we take a look at the second chapter of Acts, when the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles, what was the result of that outpouring of the Holy Spirit? The people were cut to the heart and they said, what must we do? And what was Peter's response? 
repent and be baptized. It was conviction of the Holy Spirit that was the result of Pentecost. It wasn't warm, fuzzy feelings that made everybody just swoon. So today we are living in a very dangerous position in our world and our culture. We're ignoring clear biblical teachings. We're redefining other things to make ourselves feel good. But the only real feel good that I can gather from understanding scripture is that when we confess our sins, God cleanses us from all unrighteousness and we know that we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. We don't sing that song anymore, do we? That I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb, cleansed and made whole. Now here's the difficult thing, because every one of you, if I ask you, are you a sinner, what are you going to say? Yes. yes. So confession needs to be what? An ongoing process, because every one of us are going to fail, we're going to make mistakes, we're gonna, we're gonna, we have flaws, we are not perfect, and I don't think we're going to be perfect before Jesus comes. So the process of confession is an ongoing process. It's not a one-time deal. It's not just that I confess my sins, I get baptized, and I'm all done, I'm good. Because you will screw up again. And the need for confession happens. How many of you have been married for more than 10 years? How, how many of you had to confess to your spouse that you screwed up? I hope you all raise your hand because every one of us, every one of us screws up in our relationship. How many of you, after you've confessed to your spouse, have felt better? How many of you have felt an improvement on your relationship? after you've confessed to your spouse that I really messed up bad. Why would you think it's any different with God? That we need this constant thought that we're not living up to what God has asked us. We need to confess. We need to continually be confessing. And it's not a bad thing. Please don't see this in a negative light because confession is associated with cleansing. And cleansing is a removal of guilt from you taken to the, as far as the east is from the west to the depths of the ocean. Marty, you asked me, how does this equate to Celebrate Recovery? What happens with people in Celebrate Recovery who are in addictions? They keep going through the same process over and over again. They never break out of it because they've never allowed God to cleanse them. They've never allowed God to just take it and feel a freedom Removing them from this life of repetitively sinning and then getting so feeling of guilty that they, they cure their guilt by going back into their addictions. At some level, we all struggle with that. Just understand the beauty of the teaching of the sanctuary is that if we confess our sins, God transfers that sin and that guilt into the sanctuary. He removes it from us. He cleanses us through the blood of the Lamb. Let the heart-searching work go forward. Let it be deep and earnest until every barrier is removed and your heart is open to the welcome, the messenger of pardon and peace that has long been waiting to bring light and joy and gladness. In true contrition for sin, come to the foot of the cross and there leave your burdens. Leave it with Jesus. Don't walk in and then take them right back out with you. Because true confession leaves it at the foot of the cross. We have to do it again, yes. But every time you do it, you are cleansed. And it's a good thing. You know, one of the things that we do when we do foot washing and communion, what do we say? What do we call this ordinance? Well, we call the foot washing ordinance of humility. But this is a reconsecration. Every one of us has been baptized, but... We need to be re-consecrated on a regular basis. And so we, the act of communion is a way of confessing our sins, reconnecting to God. We should be doing this on a regular basis. So let's talk about the holy, role of the Holy Spirit a little bit. I kind of got ahead of myself. John 16, verse 5 to 10. Jesus says, But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me where are you going. But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will make you swoon and feel good. He'll make you dance in the aisles and raise your hand. And No, what does it say? He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. 
Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. It is the primary role of the Holy Spirit to prick our consciences and to call us to confession. And it is a positive thing. Please don't take the negatives away from this. Oh, i got to go to confession. And you don't confess to a priest. You don't confess to me. You go directly to the throne of grace. Hebrews says we can come directly to Jesus who stands before his Father in heaven right now offering his blood in conjunction with our confessions and he lifts it up to his Father and we are cleansed through the blood of the Lamb. Now the sanctuary service was a very disturbing service. And maybe the confession of sin is disturbing. Because as a penitent, when you came to the sanctuary to bring your offering, who was it that killed the offering? You did. The priest would hold the bowl and he would hand you the knife and you would place your hand on the head of the lamb and you as the sinner, the the, the penitent, would place that knife on the throat of the lamb and cut its throat and the blood would gush out and it was an ugly, disgusting, painful. But you see, that's what sin is. And God was graphically describing that sin causes the death of an innocent one. And who did that innocent one represent? Jesus. It's only when we understand the ugliness of sin that are we ever going to turn away and say, you know what, I'm getting tired of this. I'm getting tired of this, constantly seeing the blood being just just poured out from this innocent victim. The role of the Holy Spirit is not to make you feel good. It is not to perform signs and wonders and miracles. The role of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of our sins. It is the Holy Spirit who causes us to come to the foot of the cross and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I have hurt you again and again. And the good news is, he says, I love you, my child. I'll take those sins from you. And you can walk out of here cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. I hope you're seeing the positive aspect of this. I know it's an ugly service. I know that you and I would not have chosen this particular model to represent. But God did, and he did it for a reason. And for over 2,000 years, the Jews followed this. Now, the following of the sanctuary doesn't mean you're going to see Jesus in it either, does it? Because the very people who were the keepers of the sanctuary for 2,000 plus years didn't recognize Jesus, the true lamb, when he showed up. So I don't want you to get so hung up in the sanctuary that you miss Jesus because the, the sanctuary points to Jesus in every aspect. But it is positive for us to confess our sins. And it is a desire that God has to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Holy Spirit's job is to convince us of our need to confess. And I mentioned earlier the story in Acts. The ultimate result of the day of Pentecost was people were cut to the heart and they confessed their sins. So again, I just want to repeat that on the daily operation of the sanctuary, there was a flow of blood and there was a transference of sin from the camp, from the people, into the sanctuary. And here's a graphic representation, at least it's an artist's representation. The priest did not kill the lamb, the penitent, who placed his head, hand on the head. And this is where the symbolism is. By placing your hand on the head and confessing your sins, you were transferring your sins to the animal. When the blood was let, when the, the animal was killed and the blood was taken, that blood now became the carrier of sin. And it was the priest's job to take that blood into the sanctuary and to apply the blood. So, <clears throat> symbolic transferring of guilt The lamb is slain and the blood now becomes the symbolic uh, transfer mechanism. And the priest applies the blood. Now, this is another unique teaching in Adventism that many in Christianity today are really uncomfortable with. But if you read carefully in the book of Leviticus, atonement does not happen at the slaying of the lamb. Did you know that? Atonement happens at the application of the blood. 
So it is only after the blood is applied is atonement or reconciliation with God complete. So there is a two-part work in the sanctuary that's being taught. One is the sacrifice, and two is the application. And both of them are required. So Christians of many denominations get frustrated with Adventists. I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you understand the sanctuary and the implications, that the work of the cross did not complete the work of atonement. According to the sanctuary logic and teaching, it was only when Jesus ascended into heaven, according to the book of Hebrews, and he stood before the, the heavenly altar and applied his blood on our half, that atonement was complete. So Jesus was the sacrifice, Jesus became the high priest. And in both cases, he fulfilled the Old Testament sanctuary imagery, or the model. But many Christians get upset with us because we teach a two-part atonement, as based on the sanctuary. I don't know, if, were you aware of that? Did, did you understand that? I, I don't know if you fully understood that before, but that is, that is the theology of Adventist understanding of the sanctuary, is there's a two-phase to the atonement. There is the sacrifice of the lamb and the shedding of the blood, and then there is the application of the blood by the priest in the sanctuary, showing transference of guilt from the penitent through the blood of the lamb to the sanctuary as the final repository for sin. Well, no, it's not the final. It's the temporary repository because that'll, the sanctuary will be cleansed. So Leviticus 4, 13 to 18. Now if the whole congregation of Israel commits error and the matter escapes the notice of the assembly and they commit any of the things which the Lord commanded them not to be done and they become guilty, when the sin which they have committed becomes known, then the assembly shall offer a bull of the herd for the sin offering and bring it before the tent of meeting. When the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before the Lord and the bull shall be slain before the Lord. Now, the Hebrew word tamid means daily. And in the daily sacrifice, <clears throat> there were two sacrifices that happened twice daily in the sanctuary for the people. One was at nine in the morning, approximately nine in the morning, and one was at three in the afternoon. Everybody knows the time Jesus died, right? We know from scripture Jesus died at what time? Exactly three o'clock in the afternoon. Why was that significant? because he replaced the sacrificial daily lamb that was being offered in the sanctuary. It was at that time that the temple was torn in, uh, the curtain was torn in half because that symbolized what? The sanctuary service on earth was no longer effective. It was no longer necessary. Why? The real showed up. Now here's something interesting I just learned in teaching the Revelation class. This is not in my sermon, it's an aside. I always thought when I started studying the sanctuary that sanctuary in heaven was in operation forever. But when you deeply study Revelation 4 and 5, you find out that the sanctuary in heaven was inaugurated at Jesus' ascension. And it was not functioning as the earthly sanctuary. Why? Because the sanctuary needed to be inaugurated with blood. When did Jesus inaugurate the heavenly sanctuary with his blood? It could only be after his death. So the sanctuary in heaven did not operate as we understood the earthly sanctuary. So the model was in effect long before the heavenly, and now when Jesus ascends to heaven, according to Revelation 4 and 5, he inaugurated the heavenly sanctuary, and it became an operation with him as high priest and his blood being applied. Just interesting stuff when I get into this. So the public sacrifice at 9 in the morning and 3 p.m. was offered on behalf of God's people twice a day. So if you were to sin and you were to confess your sins, there was a mechanism in the sanctuary to transfer it. You didn't always have to bring an animal because there was a model that was transferring your sin for you every day, twice a day. It was called the tamid, or the daily. There were additional sacrifices that were brought by people. You could use the tamid, or if you felt the guilt, you'd bring your own animal, and you'd do a special one. <clears throat> So this is the uh, prescription for the tamid. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two one-year-old lambs each day continuously. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning and the other lamb you shall offer at night. This is found in Exodus 29. So we see in this model, again, I want to emphasize the transference of sin from the penitent to the hazardous waste container, which is called the sanctuary. <clears throat> and the Tamid service modeled this 
constant flow of the confessor's guilt into the sanctuary. Twice a day. John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You've got to understand, John was a Jew who was steeped in Old Testament theology and who understood the sanctuary. He was referring to the sacrifice. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm going to stop here. I have to. Because the second part of this will take me as long as the first and you're already getting tired. But I'm showing you how the sanctuary gets contaminated. The next time I speak, I'm going to show you how the sanctuary gets uncontaminated because it will not be contaminated forever. What I want you to take away from this is that it is a positive thing to confess your sins. It is to your advantage to confess your sins. It is a blessing to you to confess your sins because God takes them from you and places them in his hazardous waste container and he keeps them closed and, and you don't have to worry about them anymore.